I want to welcome our Hot Springs Village campus that's joining us for this service. Excited to have them uh, joining us by video. You haven't met many of them, but Pastor Ronnie and Tuana lead there and are doing an amazing job and the church is growing and we our new sanctuary is full and we need to get to two services pretty quick it's really exciting uh, to to be part of a larger church family and excited to have you joining us uh, here's my question do you have an enemy maybe someone current or maybe it's because of something in the past You're unusual if a name or a face doesn't come to mind. It might be someone who cheated you in a business deal or a fraud who pretended to help you while taking your money. Maybe it's someone at work. You're convinced her mission is to make you miserable. Might be an ex-husband or an ex-wife who turns everything into a dramatic battle. Maybe it's someone who told vicious lies about you or someone who tears you down and constantly takes advantage of you. Maybe it's a bully at school who harasses. You might be still dealing with that enemy or with the results of what they did. And for some of you, the actions of your enemy have affected your entire life. No doubt your enemies inspire a lot of emotion. You think about what they did and you remember the hurt and you remember the pain. You remember what they took. You remember how they treated you. You might even remember specific words they said. How does that make you feel? Well, angry, resentful, hatred maybe, out for revenge, hoping bad things happen to them. Maybe you've even said, I wish they were dead. In your mind, those emotions are justified. After what they did to you, they deserve all that and more, right? In this series, we're looking at statements Jesus made that turned around common thinking in his day. Still today, they cause us to say, ouch, I mean, really? How in the world can I ever do that? Jesus calls his followers to a different life approach a higher standard. We are supposed to act and treat people differently. Counter culture attitudes and actions create curiosity. You'll stand out from the crowd. People watching will wonder what makes the difference. Jesus in his most famous message, the Sermon on the Mount, talked about enemies, how you were supposed to react and act towards them. I want to warn you, The statement we're about to study is difficult to understand and apply. Don't leave early. You need to hear it all the way through. So I want you to get your enemy in your mind. Some of you, it doesn't take long. If if you're not sitting next to them, write their name on the top of your outline. If you're sitting next to them, make up a name, but you know who you're talking about. Okay, have them in mind. You got it? Now, With all those emotions, I want to look at what Jesus says about your enemy. This teaching is recorded in both Matthew and Luke. We'll we'll look at Luke's version, but I also want to look at some of Matthew's. It starts this way. You've heard that it was sad. Love your neighbor. Hate your enemy. In other words, you've been taught, Scripture says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, which is odd because that's nowhere in Scripture. So where did that come from? The Pharisees most likely twisted a verse of Old Testament scripture in Leviticus that says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbors yourself. I'm the Lord. Well, the Pharisees put the emphasis in a little different place, and they read, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbors yourself. And that not so subtle change in emphasis justified prejudice. That's how the Pharisees explain seeing everyone who wasn't like them as an enemy. I don't have to love them because they're not my people. Even then, people found a reason to justify irrational hate. Now, it helps to understand the context of the original here. The Pharisees had a deep prejudice against the Gentiles. They wouldn't even walk on Gentile ground is how much they hated them. 
They argued that the command to love your neighbor only applied to Jews and that everyone that was not a Jew was your enemy and every enemy should be hated. Not only that, the Pharisees' definition of a true Jew was only those Jews who would follow all their rules. There was still another enemy dynamic. At that time, Israel was not free. Depending on the part of the country you lived in, people were controlled either by Herod or by the massive Roman Empire. They had to follow foreign laws. They had to pay taxes to Rome. So consider all the audiences in Jesus' statement. The Pharisees, who treated many people in that crowd as enemies. The people who were treated as enemies by the Pharisees. Everyone who hated being controlled by Herod and Rome. And then not only that, but Israel was boarded on all sides by political enemies who would periodically invade. So you can assume that everyone in the crowd had a current enemy. And it's in that context, Jesus said, I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Love your enemies, not an emotional sentiment, but the active pursuit of your enemy's good. Love your enemies, not because you're forced to, or even because you want to, but because you choose to. That's not normal. Love is not the emotion that naturally arises. Instead, this is about your will. This is a decision. No one can make you feel love, but you can choose the actions of love. I tell you who hear me, Jesus said, love your enemy, do good to those who hate you. Do good, do what's right, even though you're hated. Do not allow their actions to determine your response. Look for ways to give, to help, to be positive. Offer practical help. Do them a favor. When you go to Starbucks, bring them a drink. I had this, this situation recently. Someone was being a jerk and just causing stress. And I'm ashamed to admit it, but I withheld good because of their actions. Now, before you get too down on me, I realized what I was doing and I changed. I did good to them, even though that's not at all what I felt like doing. I refused to let their wrong make me do wrong, because then I'm wrong right along with them. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Is that even possible? When someone curses you, can you really respond with blessing? Jesus was saying, don't get into an argument. Don't match criticism for criticism, insult for insult, put down for put down. Instead, choose the right response. Build up the people who put you down. Bless those who curse you. Encourage them. Find something positive to say. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who who mistreat you. Very important, Jesus said, pray for those who mistreat you, not against those. Pray for those. Over the long haul, it's almost impossible to pray for someone and hate them at the same time. If you hate the enemy whose name you wrote at the top of your outline, start praying for them. And when you start praying for them, your attitude will change. Your heart will soften towards your enemy. Years ago, uh, when I was the target of cruel verbal attacks, I was mad. I wanted to get even. I wanted to say something. And even though outwardly I did right, I chose to stay quiet. I was simmering inside. And after a, a while, I realized that was only hurting me. So I began praying for those en enemies every day. Praying for salvation. Praying for blessings. Praying that God would work in their life. Over time, my hurt turned into compassion. That didn't happen overnight. It took months. It probably won't be instant for you. It won't be, I say, bow your heads. You pray for the person whose name you wrote down, and all of a sudden, your, your heart is full. But over time, God will work in, and God will soften your heart. It seems like a contradiction, but when you no longer hate your enemy, you win. That's when you win. 
You're not fighting their battle. Instead, you rise above that and you model the attitude Jesus commanded. Your enemy will be confused. Others watching will notice. Jesus said, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. The concept of loving your enemies and praying for people who mistreat you was completely new. It had never been taught or even imagined to interpret God's law as requiring you to love someone who did not love you. I imagine a long pause after Jesus said that, followed by the people in the crowd turning and asking each other, did he really just say to love your enemies? He can't mean the Gentiles, can he? I know he said love your enemies, but he can't be talking about Herod. He can't be talking about the Romans. There's no way I can love the Pharisees. What in the world? Jesus gave four commands. How you're supposed to love your enemies. First, love them. How do you respond to your enemies? First off, love them. That's not easy. Why did Jesus have to start there? See, we have a tendency to turn the difficult commands of Jesus into suggestions or options. But this was not a suggestion. This is a command. First, love. Second, do good. Your natural tendency is to do bad towards your enemies, to pay back evil for evil, to get revenge. Jesus said, resist that impulse, do good instead. Third, bless your enemies. This is where I think it really gets tough. Encourage them. Refuse to enter into a war of words. Instead, say good things to them, and very important, say good things to others about them. And finally, pray for your enemies. Pray God will touch them with his love. Pray God will reach them with his grace. Being a follower of Jesus means following his commands. This isn't optional. And then Jesus went on to give some practical advice of how to implement this. He said, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other. This is not about pain. Being slapped on the cheek was more an insult, a humiliation. And the normal way to respond was to fight right then. Jesus said, don't do that. Don't take the bait. Don't retaliate. Don't respond to your enemy's foolishness with foolishness of your own. And really, we could probably stop right there. The modern application is when someone challenges you to a fight, walk away. When someone insults you in front of a group, don't insult them back. When someone posts hateful things about you on Facebook, don't respond. When someone cuts you off in traffic and almost causes a wreck, don't honk your horn and yell at them and act like a fool. When someone doesn't invite your kid to the party, don't pay them back by not inviting their kid. When someone hurts your feelings, don't hurt them in return. When someone cheats you in business, don't look for a way to get even. Instead of making a fist, Turn the other cheek. Now, I know you were taught different. Listen to me, boy. Never back down from a fight. If you don't respond to the challenge, everyone will think you're weak. If they start it, you finish it. Stand up for yourself. Don't you take anything from anyone. That's all good, solid, redneck wisdom. <laughs> but the problem is, it doesn't match the teaching of Jesus. And that's our standard. You're supposed to be different. If someone takes your cloak, don't stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you. If anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Matthew adds, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Again, understanding context helps. In those days, tax revenues didn't cover all the needs of the Roman army. Bands of soldiers roamed the country. If they saw someone with something they wanted, they requisitioned it. They often abused that privilege. They just take things for the fun of taking something. The soldiers could also make the people provide forced labor. Instead of carrying their own stuff, they could legally command a citizen to carry it. And that's the context where Jesus said, if they ask you to carry their stuff for a mile, go beyond what they ask. Show love to your oppressor. That's where we get the phrase, go the extra mile. Do more than what's required. Do more than what's demanded. Live different. 
Finally, Jesus taught what we call the golden rule. We love to quote the golden rule, but it was taught in regards to your enemies, not to your friends. Jesus said, when it comes to your enemies, do to others as you would have them do to you. Instead of doing to others as they do to you, treat them the way you want and wish they would treat you. Instead of reacting to the way you're mistreated or spoke about, instead respond the way you want to be treated and spoke about. Instead of allowing other people's reactions to determine your response, choose your response in advance. I will talk about you the way I want other people to talk about me. I will give to you the way I want people to give to me. I will treat you the way I want to be treated. I will encourage you the way I want to be encouraged. I will bless you the way I want to be blessed. I will love you the way I want to be loved. Imagine applying that to every relationship in your life. At work, at home, at school, in your marriage. How different would that be? Jesus continued, if you love those who love you, what credit is that? That's easy. Anyone can love people who love them. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you good, do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Again, that's easy. It's easy to repay good with good. Even sinners do that, Jesus said. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? That's not giving. Anyone can do that. Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. That is a high standard, isn't it? Maybe even ridiculously high. Pastor Rod, why in the world would I do that? And how could Jesus expect that? If I do that, people will run all over me. They'll take advantage. They'll call me weak. Well, thankfully, these commands of Jesus don't stand alone. They come with a promise. A good way to read scripture, we tend to focus on promises. When you see a promise, look for the command. For every promise, there's a command. For most of the commands, there's a promise. When you see the promise, it makes much more sense to be willing to do the commands. If you'll do that, if you'll love your enemies, if you do all those things Jesus said, then after you do that, your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful as your father is merciful. No one had greater enemies than Jesus, so he could speak with authority on this issue. Jesus can tell you to love your enemies because he was mistreated by his enemies. Jesus loved Pharisees who later condemned him and Roman centurions who would crucify him. Jesus modeled what he expects of us, followers of Jesus, or to love everyone, even their enemies. Followers of Jesus are to treat everyone with honor and respect, even those who mistreat them. Followers of Jesus are generous. They give with no expectation of getting back. Followers of Jesus are to extend mercy, even when it isn't deserved. And when you do that, your reward will be great. What your enemies have taken from you will be nothing compared to God's reward. Every insult, every injustice, and every hurt will quickly be forgotten when you are blessed by God for following his commands. Now, I want to give you some questions to help you with self-evaluation real fast. Questions you can ask yourself to see how you're doing in this area. Number one, how do I view myself? Do I deserve better treatment than others? Am I more important than them? If you've made this statement, well, I deserve better, it's a clue. Number two, how do I view what I have? Are my possessions exclusively mine that no one else should have? Number three, how do I view my enemies? Do I see them as potential followers of Jesus, or am I waiting to celebrate when they burn in hell? Number four, How do I view my loss and my pain? Do I need others to suffer because I suffer? Do I need to get even? When my feelings are hurt, how do I respond? Number five, how do I view God? Do I trust him enough to believe that he will more than replace everything that's been taken by others? 
Number six, do I treat others the way I want to be treated? Before we pray, I want to take a minute and I want to answer the questions that I know some of you are thinking. So does that mean I have to let my enemy back in my life? Do I have to do business with the person who cheated me? Do I have to spend time with my abuser? Do I have to remarry my abusive spouse? No. It would be foolish to allow your abuser to continue his or her abuse. Don't go out of your way to have a reunion with your enemies, but you can change the way you view them, the way you respond to them, the way you talk about them, the way you pray for them. When you do that, God will honor it, and he will reward you for the mercy that you show to others. This isn't easy, is it? You're really quiet because this isn't any fun either. Nobody's like, yeah, I can't wait to get out of here. I'm going to go love some enemies. I, I really struggled with how to end this message because I like to have a clearly defined response. But this is something you have to live out every day, maybe for the rest of your life. I want you to look back to the name you wrote on the top of your outline. And now, thinking about that person, whether that's a current hurt or a long, long ago hurt. I want you to reconsider them in light of the commands of Jesus. Not options, not suggestions, commands. See that name you wrote down? We really, we really don't have an option on this. We've got to do what Jesus said. We have to love our enemies and pray for those who mistreat us and do good to those who use us and abuse us. I want to pray for you because there is a world watching and you best demonstrate the love of Jesus when you face opposition. You best demonstrate the character of Jesus in response to enemies. Just like Jesus said, it's easy to love people who love you. It's easy to bless people who bless you. It's easy to be generous to people who are generous with you. It's easy to be kind to people who are kind to you. The true test of our faith and our following is, how do we deal with those who treat us wrong? As followers of Jesus, we've got to be different. I want to pray for you that the way you treat and respond to others will reflect Jesus' commands and will beautifully demonstrate his mercy and his grace. If you're currently dealing with an enemy, I want to pray for you that Jesus' words will change the way you respond and that when you change the way you respond, God will gain glory. And then the bonus is God will reward you for following his commands. Would you bow your heads? If you say, Pastor Rod, uh, the name I wrote on the top of my outline, it's really current. This is a current situation ongoing in my life. And even while you're talking, I can't imagine how I'm going to be able to do this. And I need the grace and the help and the strength of God to be able to live this out. If that's you, stand up. We're going to pray real quick. I want to pray for you. Say, what will people think? They'll think you got a current enemy. That's what we're praying about. Okay. If someone is standing, would you go and stand with them? Put your hand on their shoulder or put your arm around them. And we're going to pray. I'm going to pray and you pray. And we're going to pray that God will give us his mercy and his grace and his power to follow what seems like an impossible command. It is impossible if you're trying to do it in the natural, but you're not trying to do it in the natural. You have the power and the strength and the help of God. Come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
I ask right now for your strength and your help for each person standing who's, who's trying to figure out how do I live this out? How can I live this out? Lord, I can't do this without you. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to do it without you. I pray, God, that you would fill them with your grace and fill them with your power and that you would just let your Holy Spirit remind them every time they're about to respond to an enemy, remind them of your words and that they would make the decision right now to obey you. And the result of that would be not only that you would reward them, but you would change the heart of their enemy. Lord, we bring our enemies to you right now in Jesus' name. We do what Jesus commanded and we pray for them. Lord, in spite of what they've done to us, we pray, God, that they would have an encounter with your love and that their, their sin would encounter your grace and they would bow their knee and they would receive you as their Lord and Savior and become a part of our family and become a part of your kingdom. God, we pray that you would bless them and that the, the all of heaven, Lord, would be concentrated towards them. Lord, we pray for our enemies that as they see the difference in us, it would spark a curiosity in them. God, I pray for people standing, some people standing, that you would actually use them to lead their enemy to relationship with you. We believe that can happen, Lord. Lord, give us the strength to stand and to obey your commands. And thank you, Lord, that your commands come with a promise. And we know we'll receive the reward. Lord, now I, I pray for people that this week when their enemy comes to mind or where their enemy calls, when their enemy walks past, your words would come to their mind and they would think, I'm going to do good. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to love them. I'm going to go the second mile. Jesus change our hearts and use that we pray in Jesus name amen and amen God bless you I love you have a wonderful week